Well, many years ago, I was camping at Priest Lake, Idaho, a beautiful, pristine lake. And we were camping not on the shore of the main lake. We were on an island camping. And it was and, and is one of my favorite places. I hope to take the kids there and introduce them to it this next summer. But I think that year it was just my dad and I and some friends and other family who were there. And my dad and I got into a little bit of mischief because we were down by the water and my dad's friend was there. I think he was on the back of his boat and he was being very careful. His boat was pulled up on the shore, but I think he was sitting at the very end and he was being very careful not to get wet. He may have just been washing his feet or something like that. And we got into a little mischief because we could see he didn't want to get wet and so we started to splash him a little bit. Probably shouldn't have, but that's what we did. And we kept going. And I joined in too. This was my dad's childhood friend. So they'd been kidding each other and having fun since they were little boys together. But there reached a point when my dad could see it had gone from a little bit of fun to anger. And now we were in trouble. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, my dad takes me and throws me into the lake so that I'm totally soaked. And in that moment, I thought, this is a very unloving and unkind and strange thing for my dad to do to me. Why did my dad do this? There can be no good reason that my dad did this to me. Sometimes in life, we find ourselves asking, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you allow this to happen to me? God, why has this happened? And we think to ourselves, there's no good reason for why this has happened. My dad told me later, <laughs> the reason he did that is because he knew the way to pacify the friend's anger against me was if I was already wet, soaked with water, and he knew that if he threw me in the lake, my dad, it would be a much better experience than if the friend did. And I would be safer and unharmed if my dad did it versus potentially what could happen if his friend did it. And then, and then he took the heat uh, and let the friend, uh, I think, tackle him in the water and so forth. I learned a lesson sometimes we don't understand what's going on, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a reason. Today we conclude our sermon series on why is there so much suffering. Uh, if you've missed parts previous to this, uh, I encourage you to go to our YouTube page, Parkwood SDA Church, and you can watch the messages before this because there's a lot of content that you, you will have missed out on. But I'm reminded from the book of Job Job's all about suffering. And, and there's two major lessons that we see in Job's experience. Number one, in the first couple chapters, the curtain is pulled back and we get a glimpse of the cosmic conflict framework a little bit like we've been talking about. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes. This battle between Christ and Satan and this battle of slander and allegations. And the only way that Jesus can win the battle is not through power but through demonstration. So we get that from Job, but then we also get when God shows up and starts talking to Job, Job has been accusing God of doing this unjustly to him, and he can see no good reason, and God shows up, and he doesn't answer Job's questions. He simply reminds Job of how little he actually knows. And when he is confronted with his ignorance he realizes, wow, God is so much bigger and so much wiser than I am. There must be a reason, and I'm going to leave it to God. So even while we strive for answers, we need to remember the lesson from Job. We know so little compared to the great God of the universe that knows so much. Greg Gansel and Yina Lee actually had an illustration that was similar to this idea. They said, imagine that you're a five-year-old, or imagine that there's a five-year-old, 
And the five-year-old has learned every time they go to the pediatrician, they see that doctor supposed to be happy, they get this sharp metal thing jabbed either into their leg or into their shoulder, and it makes them cry. So they learn. This is a, a place, an evil place, with evil people that work here. <laughs> and that's what the five-year-old is thinking. Why? Why? And that's why they give suckers, because they're, you know, or stickers. They're trying to make positive associations. But for some kids, they realize there's this evil person. Why are they doing? And there's no good justifiable reason in their mind. But notice how uh, they conclude their illustration. They say, if the difference in knowledge from a few decades, like pediatrician to the child or parent to the child, who lets them go through this because they know it'll help them in the long run, if the difference in knowledge up from a few decades supplies a justifying reason, unimaginable to a five-year-old, the difference between finite and infinite knowledge may also supply a justifying reason unimaginable to those with limiting limited understanding. We have a finite, a small amount of understanding. God has infinite. How much more can he see and know than we know? And they conclude by saying, thus, given the gulf between God's knowledge and our knowledge, it seems unreasonable to expect that we could know the God-justifying reason for every case of evil, even if such a reason were to exist. They recognize we shouldn't expect to know every single time why evil is happening in our life. We, it's unreasonable for us to know now, in the here and now, why everything has happened the way it does. But we can have an assurance that there's a framework, uh, that there is a reason, uh, and someday we will better understand why. So before we get into uh, this message, that was our introduction. Before we get into this message this morning, um, I want to talk uh, to our God and Father. Uh, would you join me in bowing your heads in prayer? Father, we come to you this morning grateful, and we also come to you realizing uh, that there's a lot of pain and suffering in our world. Lord, we don't always understand why, but I'm thankful this morning that we have more than enough good reason to know that you're a God that can be trusted and a God that loves us and is working on our behalf in every circumstance in life. And so this morning we say thank you. Inspire our minds with what you want to say to us and lead us forward, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We can have confidence, as we've seen already, that in any evil, in any suffering that you're going through, uh, we can have confidence that God would prevent it if he could do so without breaking his promises, either of free will or in the rules of engagement, or he would prevent it, any evil, as long as it doesn't lead to something worse. So today we're talking uh, about the death of suffering. We've seen and heard that God has a plan, uh, and we've already mentioned Jesus has already ultimately won the war, but what does that look like? We want to get some more data from Scripture this morning. What does the Bible have to say about how Jesus will eliminate suffering once and for all? Notice what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Scripture is very clear. When Jesus came down to this world, he defeated Satan. Can you say amen? Whoever makes the practice of sinning is of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 says, for the devil has sinned from what time period? From the beginning. He started it all. The reason the Son of God appeared was to what? Destroy the what? The works of whom? Of Satan, of the devil. Jesus came down here to destroy the works of the devil. That is immensely good news. Notice what else the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who had the power of death. That is who? The devil. 
and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus came down, and in dying, he destroyed death. He, just, he, he got the power over death, and someday, as we'll see, he will destroy it once and for all. Notice the words here of Van Hooser in his book, uh, Drama of Doctrine. He says there, Jesus' death on the cross is the victory of God, not merely over Israel's covenant rebellion, but over what? The cosmic powers of sin, Satan, and death. When Jesus died on the cross, there were cosmic, universal ramifications. And he, in that moment, gained the victory that would ultimately win this war. As we've said before, the battle is not a physical battle primarily, but it's a battle over the hearts and minds, not only of humanity, but of the onlooking universe. And Jesus couldn't win that battle through a demonstration of force, but it required a demonstration of love, of his character, of his truth. And so when Jesus came down to this world, it was not only to defeat Satan at the cross, but it was also to demonstrate the character, which was part of the plan in defeating Satan. Notice what Romans 3.25 says. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to what? What's it say? To demonstrate his what? His righteousness. This was a demonstration of the righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to what? Demonstrate his what? His righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Jesus came down and his life and death and resurrection were a demonstration of a God of righteousness, of a loving God, a just God. What does Romans 5, 8 say? But God, what? Demonstrates his own what? His love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came to demonstrate. Notice what Jesus said in response uh, during his trial before his crucifixion. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason that I was born and came into this world is to testify to the what? The truth. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to court or if you've ever had to testify in court, but when you're testifying, you're supposed to be t testifying truthfully. The goal of the court is to make a right decision. And Jesus came down to testify to the truth. So that the universe uh, trying, is Satan's accusation correct against God, or is God vindicated? Is he just and loving as he says? Now notice the, the contrast here, how Jesus speaks about the devil. John 8, verse 44. Speaking to unbelievers, he said, you belong to your father, the devil. These were people, his own country people, who were rejecting him, and ultimately, God, the, the Spirit of God. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from what time? The beginning. Again, identifying Satan as the, or, the origin of sin and suffering. Not holding to the what? The truth. For there is how much truth in him? No, 0% truth. 0%. And when he lies, he speaks his own native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus came down to demonstrate his love and to set the record straight by proclaiming the truth. And that's exactly what he did. So Jesus, in his life and death and resurrection, he provided the ultimate demonstration of God's love. And that ultimate moment, of course, happened at the cross. Notice what Jesus said leading up to the cross. He knew 
what was happening as a result of his life and his near death. It says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be what? Driven out. Jesus knew his death is going to put the death nail in the coffin of Satan, and Satan would be driven out. Because of Christ's victory on the cross, notice how John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 12 described the results, the cosmic results of the cross of Jesus. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now, this is after the cross, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his what? His Messiah. This is after the Messiah had come. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who's the accuser? Satan. Satan. Who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. And heaven breathed a big sigh of relief. Whew. Jesus at the cross gained the victory that allowed for Satan to be excommunicated from heaven. And we say praise the Lord. Revelation 12 verse 11, they triumph over him and we can triumph over Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony because they did not love their lives so much as to shrink. Notice how Beale puts it in his commentary on Revelation. He says, Christ's death and resurrection have resulted in Satan's excommunication from heaven. The legal charges, the slanderous accusations against God were shown to be false. When Jesus died on the cross and he rose again, the universe could see Satan is a liar and there's no place for him here any longer. Notice how Morris, in his commentary on the book of John, puts it. He said, just as the cross represents the judgment of this world, so it represents the defeat of who? Satan. Satan was defeated in what appeared outwardly to be the very moment of his triumph. Isn't that interesting? In the moment where it seemed like Satan had won, it was actually completely opposite. He had lost in that moment. I remember one pastor saying, when Jesus said, it is finished, Satan hoped he'd heard him say, I am finished. But instead, Jesus said, it is finished. My sacrifice is complete, and I have won the battle on the cross. I think sometimes as Protestants, we're a little shy of the cross because we don't want to worship a symbol. But brothers and sisters, we need to think more about the cross. We need to think more about the cross. I mean, we would be less selfish people if we spent more time thinking about what Jesus did for us. We would have a deeper appreciation and love for all people if we were to think more about the cross. Notice this next quotation, uh, Beale's commentary on Revelation. He says, Christ was wrongfully accused and executed by Satan's earthly pawns. But his resurrection vindicated him in the law court of where? Heaven. He recognizes this cosmic dispute, and Satan, through killing Jesus, actually vindicated Jesus. Vindicated God, the Holy Spirit. Vindicated him in the law court of heaven and enabled him to take away the devil's right and power as the heavenly prosecutor. Amen to that. Notice how John Peckham sums it up in his book, Theodicy of Love. The triumph over the devil and his slander by the ultimate demonstration of God's righteousness and love in the Christ event unleashed God's kingdom by legally disarming the evil celestial power. We can never underestimate just how important the cross was. Notice how the Apostle Paul puts it in Colossians 2, 2 verse 15. When Jesus died, it says, Having disarmed the what? The powers and what? Authorities. They're not just talking about little civil, you know, the mayor was unseated. No, no, no. These are cosmic powers and authorities. Disarmed them. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by what? By the cross. What a glorious victory Jesus won. 
Okay, so now probably some of you are thinking, that's fabulous. But how come if that was 2,000 years ago and Jesus won the victory, how come we're still here? How come we're still going through suffering? But we have to remember something that we looked at earlier in this series. Remember earlier, we talked about the wheat and the tares. I'm just going to remind you from John Peckham's words here. He says, timing matters a great deal here. As Christ portrays in the parable of the wheat and the tares, if evil were uprooted, what? Prematurely, there would be horrible collateral damage. Didn't Jesus teach that? Jesus knew we had to wait till the harvest, which scripturally is the, the second coming of Jesus. It would only be safe to remove evil at that time, and nobody knows that day or hour. So he said, the harvest is thus delayed until when the crop permits. So admittedly, there is some mystery here regarding the exact timing, because we don't know the exact timing, but Jesus, who hung on that cross for us, with his infinite wisdom, he said, it's best to wait until the harvest. It's the safest moment at the harvest. Now notice this from the book Desire of Ages. Any of you ever read this book, Desire of Ages? It is a fabulous book that will help bring you closer to Jesus and his word. Notice this insightful comment. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly what? Revealed to the angels or unfallen world. There were some that were still on the fence, like, well, maybe he has a point. But when Satan killed Jesus, they realized exactly the character that they were dealing with. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion until the cross. Later on, in another publication, Ellen White, one of the founders of our church, she had this to say. She said, the holy angels were horror-stricken that one of their number could fall so far as to be capable of such cruelty as has been manifested toward the Son of God on Calvary. They were shocked by what they saw. Every sentiment of what? Pity and sympathy, which had, they'd ever felt for Satan in his exile, was quenched in their hearts. So don't miss the point here. At the cross, the universe that had been watching this, this uh, cosmic conflict unfold, they saw it clearly and finally at that moment. But what about the world? we still need opportunity as humanity to hear the good news and to hear how lying and deceitful Satan is so we can make up our minds and to make a choice who we will serve. Jesus helped settle questions on the cross that, that, that heaven and the universe could see immediately, but it takes time for that to be worked out into the rest of the world. And you remember what uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says? Talking about this apparent or seeming delay of the return of Jesus, he says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some consider slowness. God's not dragging his feet. What's the reason in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that the second coming has apparently been delayed? What's it for? He doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And then in 2 Peter 3, verse 15, it says that the, the, uh, the slowness of our God means repentance. So another reason why there is this gap in between the cross and the return and the end of all suffering is because God is trying to save as many people as he possibly can. And only an infinite being knows the exact right time to return, given the population of the world, given the circumstances in the world. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this 
gospel, which means this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout what? The whole world as a what? As a testimony, or in other translations, a witness. Now, remember, where do we have witnesses and testimony? In a court system. The gospel is to go to the whole world so that the court of the world and the onlooking universe can see clearly the character of God, the good news. And once this has happened, then what will happen? Then the end will come. There's good news about our good God and Savior that your neighbors, my neighbors, your co-workers, your family members, people around the world need to hear. Are we going to share it? Or are we going to keep it to ourselves? Notice this from one of my favorite books, Christ's Object Lessons. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is what? A revelation of his, God's, character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life, and their character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. When the world and neighbors look at you, are you revealing the character of our God? We have a part to play. Now, some might wonder, well, why hasn't God done more? It seems like God could be doing more than he's doing. Remember last week, we, we saw that parable in Isaiah 5 of the vineyard. And we saw that God does everything he can to bring about good. God does everything he can. I love these words from John Peckham. He said, if there was a preferable way to ensure the unending bliss of love, of the love relationship, would he not have chosen it, if only to spare himself the suffering? I mean, think about that. If there had been a, a better way even if it was just for selfish reasons to avoid the cross, wouldn't God have chosen it? Of course he would have. What more could he have done? What more could he do than give himself to die for us? The cross demonstrates that God is love and testifies that God has done everything that can be done to mitigate and eliminate evil without destroying the context for the unending flourishing of love. He concludes by saying, God has suffered more than anyone. I love these words from Henri Blotcher. Evil in the cross. From the cross there will spring light sufficient to illuminate even the darkest night. Even in our deepest sorrow and suffering, we can remember the cross and it reminds us that our God was so committed to ending suffering that he gave everything he had to do it. And there was no other, no better way. Stephen Davis echoed this thought. He said, it will be evident that God chose the best course and that the favorable balance of good over evil that will, exist, that will then exist was obtainable by God in no other way or in no morally preferable way. We'll look back and we'll say, truly, God, you've done everything you could, and this was the best way to do it. I love what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us what? All things. If God didn't hold back Jesus... And Jesus, as God, didn't hold himself back. We can be confident that God is doing all that he can. As we said earlier, God has a plan to destroy all evil, all suffering. In the end, notice this, God accomplishes two primary things. First, he manifests his character over against evil, such in the universe, such that in the universe... Sorry, it's really kind of tricky sometimes to read that screen all the way back there. <laughs> Such that the universe will be what? Forever what? Inoculated. What's that mean? 
You have to get shots year after year after year after year. One and done. The cross event is so powerful and so potent that there will never ever be an opportunity for sin to rise up again. Because all of the saved will look back and say, no. And all the angels will say, no way. God is loving and merciful. I want to follow him for eternity. God could only ensure the security and love forever by going through the plan of salvation as he did it. So number one, that's what happened. Second, once the matter of his character has been settled, God exercises his power to destroy evil, and God will finally eradicate pain and evil forever. Evil will never rise again. Amen? I'm looking forward to that day. Notice, even in the Old Testament, how the prophets looked forward to that day. God, he will swallow up death for how long? Forever. And the Lord will wipe away what? The tears. It's not just in Revelation. God will wipe away the tears from their faces and all the reproach from his people. He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It's in Isaiah. It's in Revelation. But first, uh, one more verse. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Notice how Revelation puts it. Revelation 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be some death and some suffering, mourning. Thanks, Malcolm. There will be no death. No more. Neither shall there be any mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. This is good news. What else can we learn? Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, when the perishable puts on imperishable. When we get new bodies, the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Victory. Oh, death, where is your, st- where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? There's coming a day when death will no longer be a thing. Is that good news? This is the best news. There'll come a day when, as Philippians 2.10 says, that every knee, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Everybody will recognize Jesus as Lord and as our great God and Savior. The prophet Daniel pointed to this day in Daniel 7, verse 14. And to him, Jesus, looking... uh, Forward in the future, he says, to him was given a dominion and glory and a kingdom, and that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is what kind? Everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. He will set up his kingdom. We've talked a lot about the kingdom. And there will be no evil or suffering in that kingdom. Even the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, testify to the goodness of God. The rock, his work, is what? Perfect. For all his ways are what? Justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. I like these words. Last quote from John Peckham. I know it sounds like I've shared half the book with you, but there's a lot more if you want to read this book. Only one who knows the suffering of this world could be in a position to make a rightful judgment that, and now quoting Paul, the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come. As Paul, who suffered more than probably most of us will ever have to suffer, As he thought about what he'd been through, he said, this ain't nothing when I think about how good heaven will be. This is nothing. When we get to heaven, we'll look back and we'll say, wow, this is so wonderful. Not in any way diminishing the suffering, but but in comparison to the great glory and joy of heaven, it will seem like the smallest of things. 
We'll close with this last quotation. It's from a book called The Great Controversy about this cosmic conflict. This is the last paragraph. It says, the great controversy is ended, pointing forward to that day when Jesus restores all things. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire what? The entire... Oh, it's not on the screen. Well, we'll put it on the screen. It was, it was on the screen by... We'll, we'll put it on there in just a moment. I'll, I'll, I'll read it here. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats throughout the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness. Throughout the realms of illimitable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare what? God is <laughs> love. Everything declares God is love. Maybe you want to pull that book off the shelf this afternoon and read that last chapter. Uh, if you have a book, or if you want a copy, we'll get you one. Friends, what have we seen in our series? We've seen there's a lot of suffering in this world, but we have a God who entered into our suffering in order to fix it forever. And we have a God who has loved us from the beginning and will love us for eternity, even if we choose not to return his love. But as I think about Jesus on that cross... It makes me want to love him more. It makes me want to follow him more faithfully. How about you?